Well, good morning, church. Fantastic. I'm glad you're awake. Isn't it great to be able to start the morning with worship and, like, centre ourselves? Let's centre ourselves a little bit further by praying. Let's just pray together. A loving, gracious God, we just give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that we can come and worship you. And we give you thanks that we have the freedom to come and read your word without fear of persecution. Lord, help us today to hear your word afresh and anew for us. May your Holy Spirit be upon us, opening our hearts and our minds to your word today. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I mean, we are now in our fifth and final week on our series looking at comfort. Over the weeks, we have explored how God offers us comfort. Specifically, we've looked at God's tender heart. We've looked at how God offers comfort. We've looked at God who heals. And last week, we explored the Holy Spirit, which is the comforter. And this week, we're going to bring it back to being a practical thing that we do. But let's dive into our verse from Isaiah 40, which sends the foundation for why Jesus came, the Messiah, the heart of God, what God does for us. Isaiah 40 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says God. Comfort, comfort my people, says God. So as I said, I'm going to explore the final part of our topic today in this series of looking at comfort and specifically how we bring comfort to those in need, how we bring comfort to other people. You may have noticed that in this fashioning of our series, we haven't jumped straight into the practical thing that we should do each and every week. We haven't jumped in and said, look, comfort is just about us getting out into the world and doing this and helping those people in need. We've actually founded the series in the nature of God, of who God is and the character of God, rather than jumping into our practical response straight away. It's really easy for us to to bring things to practical very quickly without understanding the, the foundation of why we do stuff. And so we've spent the last four weeks exploring the nature and character of God and how God provides comfort. But the thing is, our faith is never a faith that leaves it external, out there, nebulous, where we don't do anything. Our faith is something that is practical, that we respond to, that we have a call upon our lives. So if God is a God of comfort and our comforts those who he calls his own, comforts the world, and we are followers of Christ, what does it mean for us? How do we bring comfort to those people around us? How do we offer comfort to those people in need? How do we alleviate the suffering? See, offering comfort here, I'm going to say this, offering comfort is more than just helping people in need. I want to step it up a little bit further. It's not just providing practical support for those people in need. We can alleviate the suffering of people, and that is within our power, within our grasp to do this. But we can offer even more. We can offer comfort that is beyond that because we can offer comfort of the everlasting God Almighty. We can offer comfort of God's compassion, of God's comfort to those people we meet. We are part of the vehicle of helping the world understand God's compassion, understand God's heart and bring comfort to the world. If people know Christ Almighty, then they will understand the love of God. So let's jump into the Bible. Let's have a look into this. We're going to jump into Matthew, chapters 25, and we're going to read through verses 31 to 46. And we're just going to pause and look at that as we progress along. So I'm just going to, we're going to centre ourselves into here. And it's Matthew 25. 
verse 31. And believe it or not, this reading in, in the New Living Translation and probably in a lot of the other translations is titled, and note, note, note this, that the titles that we have in our Bible are actually not there in the original text. That's there to help us. So as it's broken up, it's there to help us just be chunked into sections that we can understand. And it says the final judgment. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples, talking to the crowd around him about what it means to have everlasting life with God, what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. So let's jump into it. Verse 31. But when the Son of Man, so this is how Jesus referred to himself here, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. And I love how uh, this week we have been exploring, you know, at the beginning of our worship we had Christ the King, it's Christ the King Sunday. And this passage here is ascribing that Jesus will be sitting on his glorious throne, you know, and all the angels surrounding him. Christ the King will be there. And all the nations, everybody, this is, this is actually a view into the future, a view into the judgment of all of the world, all of the nations, everybody, will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. So you know the shepherd just going, you've got all of this flock out in the field and then bringing them in close and putting them one over here and another over here and the sheep over here and the goats over here, just moving them around. And he will place the sheep at his right hand. I'm glad I did that correctly. Right hand over that way. Very good. And the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on the right, now he's to come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the creation of the world. So judgment has, and that's, that's the thing, judgment has a realisation that what we do in the world, the choices that we make, actually has impact everlasting. It is not just we can do whatever we like in this world, but we actually have what we do has an impact in our future, in the everlasting nature of us, of our relationship with God. For I was hungry. So Jesus goes on and then says, this is the reason why. This is the reason why you have this place in the kingdom of God. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. So you can see what is the basis of the separation. What is the basis of those that were becoming, inheriting the kingdom of God, be part of that, the sheep those was actually the people that provided physical, practical, real, tangible comfort to those people in need. And then it goes on, it says, in verse 37, it says, Then the righteous will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king and Jesus says this, Will tell you to, I will tell you the truth. When you did it to the one, the least of these brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. So it wasn't about how we respond to those who are, are well off or those, you know, how we do it to Jesus, but it's actually about how we respond to the world around us, to those in need around us, how we display the comfort of God that we have received, we let that comfort out to others in real and practical and tangible things. We offer comfort to the world around us. We offer hope and hospitality. We offer food. We offer resources back to the world around so that they may have something to live off. And then, then Jesus, the king, then turns to those on the left and says, away from you, you cursed ones. Notice this is a judgment. This is actually a time of saying, 
pushing aside, one is within and one without. Away from you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his dominions. This is pretty harsh stuff. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And then they replied, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I will tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. Notice that? The separation wasn't on theology. The separation wasn't on any of those things that we often hold dear within the church, the separation was on how we provided comfort to the world around us. That separation was our, our response to the world, our response to those in need. That was where the separation was laid. But I hate to say this. All too often, people have, church, well-meaning churchgoers, And well-meaning preachers will be at the front of the church and they will use this Bible verse to guilt people into giving more and more to various charities and to their own particular ministries. And yes, that's often really good. But the thing that saddens me so often when I see this and have heard this is that they guilt the people in the church to do more and yet themselves don't do anything or do very little. These passages are not about how you place it on somebody else, but how it reads you. So don't take this passage and go, oh, I looked at somebody else out there and they weren't giving very much. They weren't doing very much. That's not what this passage is about. That's not what providing comfort is about. This is about how it reads you how God is working within you. So ask yourself, am I alleviating somebody's pain and suffering and nakedness, separation, hurt? Am I doing that? Am I giving something or am I just holding it all to myself? It's about our response, not about others, about our response. I actually had a phone call during this week um, that came into the church uh, phone system. So it came in in a couple of days ago. And during that um, conversation I was having with somebody, and and they were actually ringing. It's really interesting because we get phone conversations. I have phone conversations with people quite often about people seeking help. They want help for particular things. Often it's monetary help, but it's help for because they've found themselves into hard places. And this conversation I had really struck me and really struck a chord to me, and it really struck a chord with a specific thing that this caller said. They asked me the question in in this process of going, what what help can can you provide? It was actually really interesting because they were actually from a very long way away. You know, the other side of Sydney to where we are, they were, they were over there and we were here and I'm going, I'm not sure how we can do that practical help. Maybe we can. All of that. But then they said this. They asked me this question very pointedly and they said, why is it that churches keep on asking for money and when you need, when you need help, they don't offer? Wow. That is so big. And then she goes, oh, I'm not actually talking about your church. She goes, I I, I went to a church and I gave week after week after week and I gave all of this money and then when I asked the church and I was in desperate need, they were unwilling to do anything for me. Now, I hope that we are never coming across like that. I hope that myself doesn't come across that. But it doesn't mean that we need to be just this free-for-all release of money and goods from us. That's not what it means for us to offer support and comfort to those in need. 
but it did get me to think about what are the things that create in us a sheep and goat situation? Where is it that we have our blinkers to those who are in need and go, I don't want to help here, or that's all too hard, or I don't want to step out there. There are, there are places that we find that we are uncomfortable. There are places where we don't, aren't able to step into those areas. Now, I did say that she said it wasn't about our church. It was about the church that she used to go to. And I did tell her about what we offered and what we had and what we could do. And they said they'd come and see what they could have, which is really good. So sometimes it's actually about knowing what you can provide, what you can do and what you can do well. But also have the resources to point people to other directions where they can help as well. As I said, all too often for us, there are things that will trip us up when it comes to offering help or offering comfort to those in need. I've got three things that often trip people up. And I want to see whether this resonates with, resonates with you, yourself, or whether this, these, one of these or all three of these or whatever, you know, combination of this or something else actually trips you up on how you offer help or how you offer comfort or how you offer support to people. One of the things that trip people up is that we have a restricted set of people in whom we provide support to. So we go, I will help this group, but if you fall outside of that, then I'm not going to do that. Interestingly, we often get people that come to the church looking for help because, and specifically because, organisations have a specific group that they help and they don't help outside of that. And they look after these people and they don't go beyond. And so we often say, well, we're happy to help all of those. We do have a restricted set. We don't actually have the capacity to go beyond the, our, our sphere that we actually are working within. We're here. We do provide help through our wider networks and we do provide help into other areas, but we have a geographic region that we work. And so even just realising that, we do provide a restriction there. Now, that's not necessarily bad. It's just understanding that for us. when. Because what I don't want you to do from here is feel so guilty that you're not doing something. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to help us understand how we sometimes create little barriers for ourselves. So we sometimes tend to only help those in a restricted set of people. Now, that may be geographic. It may actually be cultural. It may be, you know, um, lifestyle. All those kind of things. We may have those things... and. Believe me, we often have unwritten ones where we think that we will help those, everybody, but we tend not to do it for a particular group of people for whatever reason. The other one, we don't see the need to help somebody else. It's their issue. They've got themselves into it. Why should I put my hard-earned money into helping somebody else? when they, all they've done is gone either spend it on cigarettes or alcohol or whatever it might be. You know, they, these are sometimes things that come up. These are sometimes the things that stop us from helping those in need. Or maybe this. Maybe you actually think that you don't have enough to give, that you're only just making the payment on your new car or on your house or whatever it might be that you've just recently bought. As that was a little pointed thing there. But so often, you'll actually find the most generous people are the ones with the least. And those with the more, more to give and do often hold it back. Sometimes we 
create barriers within ourselves and go, we won't give above this or we don't do this. None of this is about guilting you. I want us to think about this for ourselves. I want you to pray about this. What is God speaking to about this? About how we offer comfort, how we provide comfort to the others. Offering comfort means stretching beyond what we are currently doing. It means stretching beyond what we do naturally now. It means stretching beyond those boundaries that we have already provided for ourselves. So notice this. If you work within only those boundaries that we have and those three boundaries I gave you just then, you are acting more like those people who are put on the side of the goats than those on the sheep. Yes, you did help, but you didn't help those in need that were beyond. It is stretching ourselves. Take the step beyond that little bit of boundary that you have there. Is there something else that you could do? Is there another person that you could offer comfort to? Is there some way that you can provide a physical need, an emotional or psychological need? Where is it that you might help? It may not necessarily be about money all the time. It could be just about physically going and visiting somebody. Notice that one about visiting those in prison. It doesn't even have to be in jail, incarceration. It can just be somebody that is isolated, somebody that is alone, that is separated, just having that space and time and giving physical comfort, being there with a person, giving of your time, one of the most precious gifts and commodities that you can have. One of the things that we can give that will provide the best comfort, the comfort above and beyond, is not just the physical or the emotional or the psychological needs, but offer the comfort that only Jesus can provide. Comfort that comes from God. We have the capacity, we have the gifts and the skills to offer the comfort of God to those that we see. We don't do it either or. We don't just do the food and the helping hand and, and then evangelism over here. We don't just do evangelism and say, we've got to do that and then we're going to help you. We do it together. Now, famously, people have been saying people won't ever read the gospel until they've been fed. You know, the first gospel they read is you and when you offer somebody support and comfort, they will actually see that. Let me share with you a reading from John's Gospel, from John chapter 6, verse 31 to 35, and it says this, and we'll put it up on the screen. This is Jesus. He's the bread of life. He's the giver of life. And so when we're providing comfort, what should we do? We should be providing Jesus in the same time. When we offer support, provide Jesus. When we offer time and support with somebody isolated, provide Jesus. Give that support. And it says this in John chapter 6, verse 31 to 35. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they were journeying through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat, so offering them comfort in the support in their wilderness journey. God was providing that. Jesus is just providing this clarification. The Israelites thought that Moses was the one that was doing this. Jesus then said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My father did. God gave the manna from heaven and now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, sir, they say, give us this bread every day. And what does Jesus then reply? Jesus replies, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be so thirsty. Offer the bread of life. Offer Jesus. Above and beyond all things, offer Jesus, the one who will feed and provide comfort, God's comfort. Stretch ourselves to offer comfort this week and into the future. Step beyond those artificial boundaries we have created for ourselves. Let us do more than just meet the physical needs. Let us share the love of God found in the bread of life, which is Jesus. Let us just pray. 
a loving, gracious God. We just give you thanks for your word. We just give you thanks that we can delve into it and share it. And we give you thanks that, Lord, you challenge us so often. Lord, you challenge me right now to give more, to do more, to offer comfort beyond myself, to, to stretch that boundary a little bit further. Lord, help us to provide that comfort. Help us to do that to those in need around us. Help us to seek those whom we know, whom are calling on us to provide comfort. Lord, we just ask that you, you hear the cries of your people. And Lord, make those cries known to us again and afresh today. Nudge us to support those who are in need. Nudge us to support those who are struggling emotionally. Nudge us to support those who are isolated. Lord, help us to provide and be bearers of comfort. Physical, real, emotional comfort and comfort that comes only from you, O oh God. We pray this in the name and the power of Jesus. Amen.